Hello and welcome back to Continental Club where we discuss the hottest topics in European football. Joining me today we've got Henry Hill and Michael McCubbin. How are you Henry? Yeah I'm good thanks. Actually before the um, before we came on here I was uh, shaving my face for, you know, to get ready for, for the viewers at home and um, good man. My, my trimmer ran out mid shave so actually I've got a bit of like a, a two-faced situation going on right now. <laughs> oh God. I'm, not sure, I'm not sure if it, if you guys can see but I feel like one side of my face is definitely longer than the other. A bit so of a lopsided look. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe this is uh, the start of something big. But um, yeah, I'm feeling a bit weird right now. Fair, I'm feeling a bit <laughs> weird as well. I'm not really enjoying this moustache. I'm really getting quite tired of it now. But a few more days to go. Uh, McCubbs, how are you? You're not feeling lopsided? You're not hating your moustache? <laughs> not too bad, actually. I, I, another, yeah, actually, I, I forgot to um, to like trim my beard before coming on here today so i do have a bit of a neck to have a bit of kind of messiness going on on the neck um so is, so yeah, yeah i think we've we're all facing kind of facial hair problems today so <laughs> glad, to, <laughs> glad i'm not alone um, the more growth the better but yeah speaking of problems we are talking about this season's <laughs> biggest disappointments on today's Sweet. show uh we realize it's very very early on in the season but today we wanted to cover players that weren't quite living up to their best form of last year and there are some big names mentioned that's because it, at it's time to party said which players have let you down at this early stage let you down is very strong but we wanted to think you know cover some some slight players that would hope for better in the in the rest of the season but before we get into that just a quick reminder to subscribe to euro football daily and hit that notification bell to never miss a continental club but McCubs, we're kicking off with the big one the goat Lionel messi who hasn't had the best of times of it yeah, no, it's not been the best start for him, has it? Um, we actually covered him briefly on a 10 over on FD with a similar um, yeah, a similar theme, kind of players who've disappointed at the start of the season. Obviously, as you'd expect, got um, you know, got a little bit of hate from the cult of Messi, um, you know, as you'd expect. Um, but, um, but it's true, yeah, he, he's not been brilliant at the start of the season by his standards. And obviously, like you said, Dukes, it's early on in the season. Um, we've seen Messi... Um, you know, hit that, you know, cut, come back from relatively mediocre form by his standards. And, um, you know, ev there's every chance he'll, you know, he'll kick on, especially after that Betis game when I thought he was excellent um, and prove us wrong in the next couple of months. But, um, but yeah, early weeks of the season, um, yeah, some of the, some of the poorest, poorest displays I've seen from him, to be honest, at least on a kind of week by week basis. And that's coming after last season, which despite, you know, despite I think him getting more assists than he ever had done in a La Liga season. Um, it was still a relative down year for him, mainly on the kind of goal scoring end. So like he got 28 and, and assisted 24 in 41 league and UCL games. That was 1.3 goal contributions a game. Kind of what we what we expect to see from him. Um, no one in Europe contributed more than his 46 league goals. I think Immobile was just one behind um, and contributed to 53% of Barca's um, uh, league goals as well. Um, for context, Benzema contributed to 41%. And obviously we've you know, <clears throat> spoken a lot about how over Alain Real are on Benzema mm. over the last 12 months. Um, but having said that, his overall tally of 31 was fewer than the previous year. Um, sorry, 20 fewer than the previous year. Um, and that's actually his lowest tally since 2007-8, you know, when he was still, you know, when he was really still developing as a talent. So... Yeah, like I mean, I mean, last season he was still so important to that side, even though he probably wasn't. Um, yeah, he wasn't as prolific as as we'd normally expect him to be. Um, and I guess probably as a result of having to do so much work in the centre of the park, wasn't he? Um, I think we can probably all agree that last last season probably was Barca's poorest season since you know since the kind of Pep Guardiola era started. So the fact that he's started this season so slowly is a little bit worrying. Um, for Barca. Um, luckily, obviously, like Ansu Fati had an amazing uh, start to the season, didn't he? And now that he's out for a few months, I think it really is up to Messi um, to, to kind of drive that attack forward. Um, so in the seven La Liga games he's played this season, he had two goals, two of, uh, sorry, three goals, two of which were penalties. He's registered zero assists so far, which I think is the more worrying aspect. Mm. Um, his shots have fallen from 5 to 4.8. I think they were about 5.7 the season before in 18-19. Uh, uh, key passes are down to just two a game, um, down from 2.8 last term. And his dribbles are down to 4.2 per game from 5.7, um, which obviously, you know, they, those are pretty amazing stats for anyone. But for Messi, um, 
I think I think um, was it yeah it was Musa Okwonga on the Stadio podcast I was listening to a few weeks ago and he was describing one of his performances I can't remember which uh, which t- uh, game it was um, but he kind of he just said you know Messi looks mortal which is you know something hmm. um, which yeah we're not we're not used to seeing is it he he looks like a um, you know just a, a, a an excellent attacker rather than you know just a kind of completely Freak. different force of nature. Um, his expected goals is still pretty solid, 0.82 per 90. Um, hasn't been above 0.9 since 14-15. But like I was saying, it's his creativity, um, which is the most concerning, especially considering that that was the aspect of his game which really made him stand out last term. So he's uh, registering just 0.18 expected assists per 90 this season, um, which would be, yeah, what, like, expected to get an assist once every five games or so. Mm. Um that's actually the fifth best in the Barca squad. That's lower than 17-year-old Pedri's. Obviously, he's had a pretty promising start to the season, hasn't he? But um, really, Messi should be far and away out on top there. Um, and it's something you'd obviously hope that will improve in the uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and when you look deeper, it's not too much of a surprise. Um, 2.6 passes into the penalty area per 90. That's down from 3.9 last season. His progressive passes have actually gone down as well. So it's not even like he's doing as much work in build-up as he was before. Um, and uh, nine players in La Liga have created more than his 13 chances so far. Cuesca's 32-year-old right winger, David Ferrero, has created double that. Um, I've not actually watched him play, but I, I might <laughs> do after after hearing that. Um, so, um, so, yeah, and obviously this is all in front of a backdrop of, of what happened in the summer, isn't it? We don't need to go into what happened in the summer. We've discussed that to death on here. Um, but yeah, there, there's there's maybe a little bit of hangover from that. I don't think he's, you know, I don't think, you know, I don't think anyone's saying really that he's um, like given up on the side or anything. But you know, probably the most stressful period of his career um, in that in that very short close season after that eight two drubbing and everything that happened with Barton Mel. Um, and yeah, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I think, you know, you you've got to consider that. That, that may have had an effect on his early season form for sure like I th- you know he, he is only human at the end of the day um, and uh, you know I saw something this week about Antoine Griezmann's uncle who I think was was his agent before kind of coming out publicly and basically suggesting that Messi isn't a fan of Griezmann and kind of laying some of the blame at his door for really? for Griezmann's poor form yeah and, and, and then Messi came out being like um, kind of quite rightly saying, you know, why why is every problem at this club? Why is it, um, you know, Always why me, do yeah. I kind of get, yeah, why do I get some of the blame for for all the problems at this club? And um, yeah, so it's a tough one. Obviously, mm. you know, we know like how much Barca pay Messi. We know that, you know, it, it, he does, you know, hold a lot of power at the club in in, in that sense. Um, you know, there's always going to be pressure on him. There's always going to be. Um, the finger pointed at him if things aren't going to plan, but but it's very very clear that he hasn't had the start of the season that he would have liked, um, and it's clear that the team still needs him. Um, you know, Ansu Fati at 17 isn't going to be able to um, galvanise that attack for an entire season. Um, obviously, he is injured now, but even if he was fully fit for the entire season, you know, he wouldn't be able to kind of um, you know imitate Messi's form, would he? Um, and you know the, the side are, is suffering as a result. Um, they they're taking thirteen point seven shots a game. That's level with Atletico Madrid. Obviously, Atletico Madrid have been more exciting this term, um, but they should certainly be posting um, better better shot shot numbers than them. Um, you know, and that's way down on Europe's elite as well, isn't it? Thirteen point seven. That's that's pretty average. You know, mm. that's kind of like what Everton mm. are Everton are man- managing the season, or even less than Everton. Um, they have the <laughs> fifth best attack according to expected goals. Currently sit nine points behind Real Sociedad with two games in hand, um, and you know even Ronald Koeman said that um, you know said that Messi's form could be better. So it's not you know it's it's not a you know I don't think it's I don't think we're being harsh on him in any way. Um, but yeah, if Barca wants to to actually challenge for this title, um, then I think Messi needs to you know needs to find that magic again. Absolutely, yeah. They they literally can't afford him to not produce his best on the pitch and they actually can't afford him full stop at the moment either I mean we, we released a, uh, our first ever Euro Football Daily Explains last week on why Barcelona might go bankrupt it was an excellent script by Pat uh, and his wages are, are potentially going to cripple the club long term which isn't his fault you know he 
you know, uh, it was a, it was a two way agreement. The club agreed to pay him that much, but he really does need to find his best form, especially with Ansu Fati, as you say, their best attacker so far this season, out with a long term knee injury. Usman Dembele's shown fits and starts so far. Hopefully, he can continue. Trincao and Pedri have adapted pretty well, but Coutinho and Griezmann still not producing the goods on a regular basis. So. There's plenty of pressure on Messi, as there always is. And who's really surprised that he's not producing his best form after the summer of turmoil yeah. and losing his best mate, Luis Suarez, in the way they did? So no massive surprise there. Nothing too much to worry about. But Barcelona really need him to start producing the Messi-like performances we've seen over the last few years. Henry, let's head over to Germany now, because it was only about three or four months ago that we, were, we released a scout report on Jadon Sancho saying that he was currently operating at messy levels <laughs> or getting close to that. But this season, it hasn't quite worked out for him. You're right, he was. I mean, we obviously talked about Jadon Sancho a ton last season and, you know, quite rightly, um, some absolutely incredible statistics with 33 goal involvements uh, in 32 Bundesliga games. 17 of which were starts as well. And, you know, for context, only Lewandowski and Timo Werner contributed more in the league. So that gives you, you know, a reflection on just how amazing Sancho was. And But this summer, it's, it's kind of gone off the boil a little bit. He's gone into the, um, well, winter, heading into winter now. And it's not quite been the same Sancho as we remember last time. You know, mm. one goal, two assists and eight uh, league and Champions League games. And his only goal of the season really came in that 3-0 victory over Zenit St. Petersburg. Obviously, people will be watching this after the most recent international break where he did pop up with a goal, a, really, a nice goal against Ireland. And obviously, he assisted Phil Foden for his first England goal too. So he was showing signs of that Sancho that um, we came to know and uh, love last season. Um, and yeah, as you said about Messi, McCubs, I th there's no point going over everything that happened with Sancho and his transfer saga this summer but it's like it's even Lucien Favre the Dortmund coach has accepted that maybe did have a contribution to his poor form right now you know um, the fact that maybe his head was turned a little bit maybe he's not his heart's maybe not quite in the uh, cause at Dortmund well alternatively he also said no player is on top form for a whole year that's impossible and I think maybe that's um, that sentiment is what is more applicable to Sancho in this situation because if you look at his statistics He's doing a lot of good things. He's still performing very well. Mm. I mean, 2.4 shots per 90, which is up from two. Two key passes down from 2.7 and 3.8 dribbles, which is up from three. So these are all really impressive numbers by any means of the imagination. It's just his problem is he's just not being as effective and clinical in the final third. And, you know, I think a start I've got here, which makes it very clear, is his combined expected goals and assists per 90 have fallen from 0.87 to 0.44 in the squad and this is obviously behind Erling Haaland and Marco Royce but also level with teenagers uh, Gio Reyna and Jude Bellingham so you can see there that he's not he hasn't got that kind of end product necessarily at the moment mm. and you know a stat which really also helps explain that is his shot accuracy has fallen from 54% to just 25% this term so, you know, he's getting these positions, he's, he's getting his shots off, but it's not quite, um, he's just not finding the target with much frequency. I mean, if you look at the rest of the team, only Haaland has taken more than his 12 shots and Rafa Guerrero and Julian Brandt um, have created more than his 10 chances. And he's completed five more dribbles than the next bets with Gio Reyna. So like I said, it's all there. It's all there. It's just not quite clicking when, when they really need it to. But as I said, like it's not all bad. He's getting 4.4 passes into the penalty area per 90 compared to 2.2 last term. He's just not on the end of those passes as much. And he's still as just as useful in ball progression, still carrying it 138 metres per 90, which is pretty nuts, from 133 last, last campaign. I think it's worth remembering with Dortmund, you know... Harlem wasn't there for the first half of last season. So they really needed another player to step up. And I think Sancho was that guy. You know, Marco Royce has fluttered him in and out of form over the last few seasons. But if you look at their squad, they have a much more attackingly rounded squad because obviously Paco Alcacer dropped off at the start of last season. But, you know, Gio Reyna is there. He's contributed one goal and three assists in seven Bundesliga games so far. Julian Brandt's still there and they're about all those. He's only had ranked 14th in the squad for minutes. And... Um, yeah, I mean, Haaland's obviously been in unbelievable form this year so far. So I think if you look at the squad, there's maybe less pressure on Sancho's shoulders to be that man who's performing. And obviously Dortmund are doing quite well in the league. I think they're, you know, seconds um, after that defeat to um, Bayern Munich recently. So yeah, they've got these other players who are rising to the occasion. But I mean, let's face it, they still do need Sancho, Sancho to step up and um, 
at least try and get close to achieving what he did last year. I'm not saying that's necessarily possible. He's not an out-and-out striker at the end of the day, we have to remember. Um, but, you know, they do need someone else in that squad who could come close to sort of the 25, 30-goal margin which Haaland, which Haaland is currently operating at in order to close that gap on Bayern Munich. So it is an interesting one with Sancho. I think, you know, whereas Messi is a bit more... I, th- I think the, the, the situation with Messi is a lot more to do with maybe what's going on in his head. Um, right now I just think with Sancho he's just it, it's maybe just taking him a little more time to warm up into the season as we said it's all there in principle he's still performing well as a player and posting stats which you know in any other script we could be lauding as our oh, how much potential it's obviously we just know what he can achieve mm. and it's just about converting that final product because he's still he's still doing very very well um, in many aspects of his game and I think maybe even just this international break of England where he has he did sort of in the spurts that he did play, he did perform quite well. Another goal and an assist under his belt. Maybe it's just little things like that he needs to kick on. Yeah, yeah. No. I think the I think that the difference is that there as well, like you were saying, Henry, is that like Sancho does have a really functional attack around him as well. So you back him, you know that 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 instantly kind of I don't know make, make makes it more likely that he'll he'll start producing again quicker. Mm. Um, but I guess yeah, I guess like Favre has just got a bit of a headache at the moment because Gio Reyna's form has has kind of yeah like I don't know has changed a lot of things in that attack like you're saying like Julian Brandt it's crazy how how little game time he's getting at the moment well exactly um, and and Torgan Hazard as well who's had his injury mm. issues but I think he's only started two Bundesliga games um and and Renier hasn't really got any minutes whatsoever mm-hmm. I think he's on about 38 but as you say McCubbs I think yeah Dortmund's attack Sancho he, he's almost raised expectations so high with some superhuman performances last yeah. year almost before anyone would have predicted them, really. There was that spell between about November and February where he pretty much contributed a goal in, in every single game he played. And, you know, as as Favre says, it's impossible to keep your form as at such a peak level, at least being as clinical as that for an entire year at his age. So he'll, he'll come again for sure. But yeah, I, I wanted to move on to someone in Italy now. We're really going around the houses in Luis Alberto because he was definitely one of last season's surprise packages. Now, the 28-year-old Spaniard is best remembered in this country for a pretty disappointing spell at Liverpool in about 2013-14. But he's now actually in his fifth year in Rome with Lazio and he's actually been a pretty consistent performer for them over the years with his league goal contributions per season going 13 25, 9, and last season, 21. He contributed a fantastic six goals and 15 assists in the league last year. Uh, those assist numbers were only topped by Papu Gomez in 36 league games. And Lazio were superb for much of the season. They were only one point behind Juventus going into lockdown, but they only won five of their remaining 11 games to finish fourth. It felt like the age of their squad the the sort of lack of depth in parts it didn't really help having a three month layoff like it did other clubs who seemed to work on their shape and get everyone fit Lazio were on a complete roll in February the break really didn't help them at all um, and while the Sevilla Academy graduates you know statistics don't look awful uh, he's still taking 2.4 shots down from 2.8 three key passes down from 3.2 and two dribbles uh, he's being far less effective it's basically the Sancho and Messi story. Uh, 0.34 expected goals and assists per 90, down from 0.51 in 1920. Uh, And Lazio have largely struggled. Three wins in seven, uh, with two draws and two defeats, and their ninth six points off AC Milan. And when I've seen them this year, they've had a lot of injury issues, to be fair. Uh, Correa's missed some games, Chiro Mobley's missed some games, Lucas Lever's been out. Uh, so that's yeah, and Strakosha as well. So that's a pretty, you know, that's pretty much their most important players uh, have missed large parts of the season. They're slightly lacking the dynamism of last year. I think, uh, I think they'll be fine, but they probably won't finish in the Champions League spaces. But they need Luis Alberto, one of their key creators last year, to get back to his best. And I watched them against Juventus, and they were really second best all over the park to Juventus, and got very lucky with a Felipe Caicedo goal. Uh, in the 94th minute to equalise in that game. And the previous week against Torino, it taken a 98th minute winner from Caicedo to uh, to win the game. So some question marks over Lazio and Luis Alberto definitely needs to pick it up. But I also wanted to talk about another disappointment briefly in Sevilla. Because last season, they finished the season absolutely exceptionally well. They went unbeaten in the league from the 9th of February. That was the final 15 games of the league season. 
finished fourth and won the Europa League, beating Roma, Wolves, Man United and Inter along the way. So really the cream of the crop in that competition, they beat them all. And this summer, they were actually fairly busy compared to most Spanish sides. They brought in Rakitic, Marcus Acuna from Sporting Lisbon, Usama Idrissi, who we've been talking about on EFD for quite a while, from, uh, from RZ Alkmaar, Oscar Rodriguez from Real Madrid, and Suso from AC Milan. But this season, like Lazio, they haven't started the season at all well. Three wins in their opening seven games, with one draw and three defeats, has left them 12th, just three points clear, uh, sorry, four points clear of relegation. However, it is a bit of a skewed league table because if they won both their two league games in hand, they started the season late, obviously, because of going to the Europa League final, they could be fourth. And their Champions League form hasn't actually been too bad. They beat Wren and Krasnodar and drew nil all with Chelsea. Their main issue, as it was really last year, or maybe less so last year, the year before at least, has been goals. Uh, they've only scored more than one goal in two of their 10 games in all competitions. That was the 3-1 win away at Cadiz on the opening day and a 3-2 win versus Krasnodar in the Champions League. They rank 6th for shots, 8th for shots against and 6th according to expected points. So from, from the end of last year where it looked like they could really kick on, uh, you know, confirm their space in the top four in Spain and, and they made some good signings as well, I'd argue. They haven't really produced so far, so far sorry. And it hasn't really been helped by their issues up front. Luke de Jong's form has got worse. He struggled in his debut campaign after joining from PSV with seven goal contributions in 35 league games. But this year, he's only got three in 10. And his shots have fallen from 2.5 to 1.3, which is really quite average. Uh, it's very poor, actually, really, from a central striker. You'd expect that from maybe like a... Uh, maybe a central midfielder, a particularly attacking central midfielder. And his XG per 90, get this, is down to 0.07, which is down from 0.45, which is terrible. You probably expect James Tarkovsky's uh, expected goals per 90 to be higher than that. So, so for Luke de Jong leading the line at one of Spain's biggest and most prestigious clubs, that's really not good enough. Uh, that actually ranks ninth in the Severe squad. And they are so over reliant on Lucas Acampos now. And their other forwards, El uh, En Nesri and Munir, are still very young, really. Although Munir has been playing at the top level for quite a while. So it should really be producing on a more regular basis. But compared to where they were at the end of last year, Lopetegui will be pretty disappointed with how Sevilla have started this campaign. And their lack of ability to build on, uh, yeah, what was a really solid end to the season. So some question marks over Sevilla. Just before we move on to our big match preview, guys, I wanted to ask you... Who are you most worried about of the people we've mentioned? Luke de Jong, Messi or Sancho? McCubs, I'll go to you. Um, difficult. I think um, potentially Luis Alberto. Um, oh, Luis Alberto, just, yeah. Um, <laughs> just because, like you say, that Lazio team has been um, quite disjointed at the start of this season, hasn't it? And he has been, although he was very impressive last season, um, you know, he was also working with Immobile, who was at the very top of his game, um, so you know a lot of those, you know a lot of those chances that he created was were getting put away by very clinical Immobile, mm. um, and yeah, and as we've seen, his you know his, his his form does fluctuate a little bit season on season. So yeah, I'd perhaps be a little bit worried about him, especially considering that he was really there, was was very much their chief creator last term. Absolutely, and Henry, if you had to get out your crystal ball, I'm going to you on mm. this because. You know, you did predict, predict Suarez to Atletico Madrid about four months before it happened. How That's many right. goals and assists in the league do you think Sancho is going to end up with this year? Ooh, I reckon, I reckon, fifteen to eighteen goals and assists combined. I still think eight goals, Ooh. seven assists. Well, maybe his assist count could. Yeah, I think maybe like eight goals and ten assists. I reckon that's where he could end up. But um, still very solid. That's a big drop. Yeah, off. I, I, that's a big drop off though, isn't it, from last actually, term? Yeah, it is. It is a big drop off. But I, I still think once he gets a bit of symmetry going with Haaland, um, as long as Haaland stays fit, I think that's a big caveat to the situation. Um, then yeah, I still, I, th I still think his numbers could explode once he's kind of warms up into the season. But I'd, I'd also like to add that I always worry about Luke De Jong. I think he's uh, <laughs> he's he's the most Eredivisie striker there ever was. He's been used wherever he goes beyond PSV Eindhoven. He's just like unbelievably average. He does opinion. bang them in yeah. the Dutch league though. Too, it's so. it's ridiculous. I was just looking. I'm just looking at it now. He scored like 26 one season, 28. But then whenever he's gone abroad, he's never ever got his double figures in a different country, which yeah. is quite an interesting thing. But anyway, yeah, um, Sancho. I still reckon he get up to about the 15-18 combined mark which 
by any means the imagination is a good season absolutely yeah I think I think he'll be fine I think he'll be fine but yeah I get your point about Luke De Jong get back to Holland maybe Luke I don't know <laughs> but guys who are your biggest disappointments of the season get them in the comments down below what do you think about Messi, Sancho, Luis Alberto and Sevilla's form so far this season and let's move on to our big match preview for our big match preview this week, we could have talked about Atletico Madrid versus Barcelona, which takes place on Sunday, but we talked about La Liga and the La Liga title race in this week's podcast over on Football Daily Podcast, so if you want a bigger breakdown of their form at the start of this year with me, Pat and Joe, go check that out. That dropped on Wednesday, but I thought for this week, we haven't actually talked about a Serie A clash for ages, and there's a big one this weekend. It's Napoli versus AC Milan this Sunday at 7.45, sees first take on third in a huge game. My Cubs, let's kick off with Napoli because there was some question marks going over them into this campaign, but they've been answered pretty emphatically. Yeah, I mean, I'd be the first to admit that I had my question marks over Gattuso when he took the Napoli job. Obviously, didn't do a particularly good job at AC Milan by, AC Milan by any stretch of the imagination, did he? Um, but I guess you have to consider that AC Milan as a club were, were kind of in turmoil behind the scenes at the time. Um, and it was his first real top-level job, a lot of pressure on him as a, as a former player as well. Um, and yeah, just j j just didn't seem like a good fit um, above all else. Um, and I think, yeah, even in the kind of early Napoli days, I wasn't particularly convinced. Obviously, his kind of relationship with Herving Lozano looked to kind of have put put the uh, the Mexican forward already kind of on the transfer list almost. We mm. were kind of expecting to see him leave by the end of the season or end of last season. Um, weren't we um, and you know his kind of reputation for kind of building very defensively solid sides but not particularly exciting sides um, I think that kind of yeah put a bit of a cloud over him as well at least from my perspective however um, actually when you watch Napoli play they're, they're not you know they, they haven't really abandoned too many of the ideals that that they were kind of sticking to under Ancelotti and even Sarri before. And I think that's probably testament in some ways to the fact that they've managed to keep a lot of their old heads and they, they, they're they still performing, you know, the likes of Dries Mertens and Insigne and obviously Koulibaly at the back. They've still got that very solid spine. Um, you know, they lost Alan in the summer, but, you know, Fabian Ruiz is an excellent deep-lying kind of operator, isn't he? Um, and Bakayoko has, has started life pretty well in Naples as well. Um, but nevertheless, you know, there was a bit of pressure on Gattuso at the, the end of last season. Um, they only won five of their last 10 games after lockdown. They lost three of those as well. Um, that's including to rivals Atalanta and Inter, which I think probably, you know, makes it a bit more understandable, to be fair, considering how strong those sides were going into the back end of the season. Um, but they finished seventh, which was their lowest placing since 2008-9. Um, you know, really before kind of really before the era that they've been so kind of dominant in, in, in Italian football. Um, and uh, yeah, that Coppa Italia win, I think, um, you know, went some way to, to easing the pressure on him, didn't it? I think that kind of showed um, that, that kind of performance against Juve in that final and beating them on penalties. I think that kind of showed the character that he's instilled in this side. Um, but nevertheless, that you know, there was a lot to catch up on. Um, they finished 16 points behind fourth place Lazio. That was the same gap as between them and 13th. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot of work to do. Um, but, yeah, this season has been, yeah, they, they seem to have really evolved somewhat. Um, they've won five of their opening seven games. Um, you know, only defeats were to Juve, which was on a technicality. Um, hopefully that issue will be resolved soon. Um, and Sassuolo, who they lost 2-0 uh, two a few weeks back, and um, they thought they were actually pretty unfortunate to, to lose that game, created a number of big chances against a very good Sassuolo side. Um, they currently sit third, three points behind leaders Milan. Um, and obviously, if that, if that Juve result gets overturned, then, then they'll be a lot closer, won't they? Um, and yeah, they, they look very deserving of their place um, kind of in, in that uh, part of the table. Um, they've scored 15 goals so far. That's actually topped by five teams, but only... Uh, two teams have uh, conceded fewer than their seven. Um, again, um, with that Juve result, I think that would go down to four because it was a 3-0 result, wasn't it? So mm. so basically had the best defence in the league as well. Um, and the underlying uh, stats kind of confirm this as well. Um, they're averaging 19 shots a game. That's 1.9 more than next best Milan. Um, that's got to be putting them up there in the top two or three in Europe as well. Um, they're only conceding 8.5 shots a game. That's second in Italy behind Inter. Um, 
XG suggests they have the 8th best attack, best defence, uh, and are the 3rd best team in Serie A behind AC Milan and Roma. Um, so yeah, as you can see, that that, that defence is still very, very solid. Um, and yeah, maybe the attack, maybe, maybe the quality of chances they're, they're creating can improve. Um, but when you've got a player like Herving Lozano in the form that he's in, a um, player like Victor Rossman in the form that he's in, you back them... Um, you know, you back you back them to score two to three goals each game. To be honest, especially against the lesser opposition. Um, so herving has got four goals and assist in twenty six games. Oh, sorry, Herving had four goals and assist and one assist in twenty six Serie A games last season. He's already matched that tally in six appearances this term. Um, his shots have stayed around the same level, two point nine per match, but he's a lot more clinical. Uh, his xG per ninety has risen from zero point three five to zero point four five. Um, Hasn't scored in six games actually in all competitions. So after that kind of early early week early weeks flurry, um, he has quietened down a bit. But with the kind of um, with the kind of combination that's kind of emerging between him and Victor Osimhen, you'd back him yeah back him to get back on the score sheet soon enough. Um, and yeah, Osimhen obviously massive pressure on him wasn't there in the summer. I thought that sixty three million pound price tag was was pretty overpriced if I'm honest. Um, but he's responded very well. Two goals and an assist in his first Serie A, uh, six Serie A games. And we've spoken a lot already, haven't we, about the work that he does off the ball, the, mm. the kind of ho his hold-up play. Um, he's really helped kind of stitch that attack together. And his stats illustrate this as well. 5.2 shots a game. Key passes are nearly at two a game as well. Completing over a dribble. Um, expected goals and assists per 90 is actually the best in the squad at 0.71. Um, that's really excellent stuff. You know, that's kind of... Um, guess like yeah kind of like Sadio Mane levels at least his level from last season um other shouts obviously Dries Merton excellent as ever he's creating over three chances a game at 33 years old Giovanni Di Lorenzo um who I think kind of went under the radar a little bit last term kind of quietly one of their key players mm. since Gennaro Gattuso's come in um he's completing nearly five tackles and interceptions for a side which is you know averaging 54 percent possession so a big part of the reason why that defense has been so solid this term um so yeah i think this could be a really good tie i actually i potentially fancy napoli for this one because obviously ac milan um haven't had the best results in the last couple of weeks yeah um and home advantage is as much of that as that as a maybe a bit more of an arbitrary kind of um factor these days but um yeah i i'd back napoli for this oh it should be an absolute monster tie um two <laughs> Two sides in fantastic form. But Henry, let's talk AC Milan because, you know, they've started the season fantastically well as well. Sure, they have. I mean, they, they, they continued their amazing kind of post-lockdown uh, performances with four straight victories in the league, uh, scoring nine and conceding just two. But as uh, McCubbin uh, just pointed out, they have dropped off in recent weeks in quite alarming fashion, actually. Um, they drew 3-3 three, three of Roma. Then there was a 2-2 draw with Hellas Verona, where they scored a 93rd minute equaliser. Quite lucky in that game. I mean, Zlatan's been missing a fair few penalties. Mm. And they also lost 3-0 at home against Lille in the Europa League. And it was a really comprehensive defeat, actually. Lille sort of, you wouldn't have known that uh, they were playing in the uh, San Siro. They sort of really took it to them. And that ended their unbeaten run, which stretched all the way back to the 8th of March. We consider all the kind of the football that's been going on since then. That's pretty remarkable. And these uh, slip-ups mean they're only two points above Sassuolo uh, in, um, after seven games. And they face Sassuolo soon, as we'll come on to a bit later. So that's really, that adds a bit more spice to the occasion uh, when it comes to this game too. Um, it's not all doom and gloom still. Uh, they still look like a top four side minimum, which really is what AC Milan, that should be their target this year. The fact that I think they're in first is an almost an overachievement based on um, uh, their recent history. I think, you know, Champions League football has to be their number one aim for this season but anyway only Napoli take more than their 17.1 uh, shots which is up from 16.3 from last season well their 9.7 shots against is down from 11.9 last term so you know they're looking more effective up front and at the back which really is a you know, basic key to success here and they're the second best side according to XG with the sixth best defence and top according to expected points um, but they're like, the slight concern is really that they've conceded at least two expected goals in each of the last four league games they've played and as we see you know 3-3 against Roma and 2-2 with Hellas Verona there so you know it's it is they're beginning I don't know if it's just like the busy football schedule but they are they're not quite showing that invincibility in that early form which um, made us so exciting you know we've obviously discussed AC Milan a fair bit on the um, on the show in 
recent months. But you know, let's let's look more positively at the players and look at why they are in first in Serie A at the moment. And it's obviously easy to focus on Zlatan Ibrahimovic, eight goals, one assist in five games. Rafa Leao as well, two goals and three assists. And obviously Teo Hernandez at left back, who has just been brilliant this season. But you know, one of the really underrated stars this season has been Franck Cassier. You know, he's a 23-year-old Ivorian. I feel like he's been around for a very long time. You know, yeah. this is his fourth year playing for Milan. You know, he had a two-year spell from Atalanta, um, a two-year loan spell. Sorry, I should add, before signing permanently in a 21.6 million deal last summer. You know, in 1920 he came in for a bit of criticism. He did score four goals and one assist in 35 league games. But then, you know, this season defensively he's been really astute. You know, 2.8 tackles and interceptions per 90. That's the same as last season. And 1.5 shots, which is up from 1.2. You know, his dribble's improving. His pass accuracy has reached, you know, his passing accuracy here says 91%, which is amazing, especially yeah. for a midfielder. Uh, you know, you often see that for context. You often see that uh, maybe from centre-backs who have maybe less pressure on the ball so to see Kessier who's um, obviously progressing a bit higher up the pitch to see him manage to achieve that as well that's a really impressive uh, statistic and he's completed every single dribble that he's attempted this season that's 13 out of 13 so yeah some really lovely stuff uh, from Kessier who's really um, becoming that player I guess we all sort of predicted he might be a few years ago and Donnarumma in goal, 21-year-old. He's oh, once again feel like he's been around forever now. But he's been amazing. He's been amazing. You know, 79% save percentage is bonkers. Thirds in Italy, and uh, you know, that's one of the best you'll see across Europe at the moment as well. I mean, obviously he's quite lucky that he's not facing a huge amount of shots thanks to his tight, thanks to the tight defence. But you know, it's once again brilliant. And also, I'd be nice to give a shout out to Alexis Salamakis. Uh, maybe a bit more of a lesser known quantity to the other two. But he's a 21 year old who arrived from Anderlecht on loan in January and they made that deal permanent for just 4.5 million euros, which is the lovely kind of little fee that you like to see, sort of a nice little bargain. And Sneaky he's appeared fee. in every. Yeah, it's great. I mean, he's appeared in every game so far, as maybe like a right winger, right back, and he's got one goal. 2.9 tackles and interceptions, a shot of 1.9 key passes. So yeah, I mean, look, for 4.5 million euros, you can't ask more than that. It looks like a really nice addition an interesting take i mean so do you you and i are working on a top 10 script at the moment which is looking at sort of people struggling with their contracts and stuff like that this is maybe why i'm, I'm not suggesting this is a reason why but perhaps things are going a bit wrong but ace man i do have a problem you know don rumor he's yet to extend his deal mm. i think he wants about 10 million euros a year that's what i understand he's obviously managed by mino Raiola, who's no easy man to negotiate at the best of times uh, so they're still trying to struggle to get him to sign on the dotted line. And then also Hakan Chahanoglu, uh, their Turkish midfielder, who um, you know last season was amazing under Pioli. Nine goals and nine assists. But this season he's really he's sort of dropped off so far. And he's the kind of player who the fans of the San Siro, they either love or hate. They're, when he's playing well, they love him. But when he's not, they, they're more than happy to sort of dig into him. And his, his form has kind of dropped off a little bit too. And he's he's making noises that unless they sort of achieve Champions League football, he he's not really interested in pursuing that project anymore. The, uh, you know, he's about mid-20s now, 25, 26. Um, so yeah, you've got sort of two kind of key players there who are sort of voicing concerns um, potentially about their contracts, which is it, maybe like just a little interesting piece of gossip for uh, Milan there. And obviously they have a bit of an interesting run in now before Christmas. They play Fiorentina first, who I expect them to beat. Fiorentina are going for a rough patch. But then, as I said, they do face Sassuolo and Lazio all before Christmas, combined this Napoli um, match-up this weekend. These are all really big games. And this will really, if we want to see if Milan are serious about setting out their stall, uh, certainly Champions League contenders, and as contenders for Serie A, because this is an opportunity to go for it. You know, Juventus are looking a bit quite poor at the moment uh, so Swallow riding high and Atalanta not quite sure what you're going to get with them at the moment so yeah this is a big moment for them as this game could really get their momentum going is that that run in before Christmas and we'll see just how serious Milan are about taking on competition this year but I mean I, I agree with I agree with my Cubs in this one I think for Napoli I, you know Dries Mertens still looks amazing scored that wicked goal against England I think the game's there for Napoli to take and you know they did look good against the Swallow and they were quite unlucky um, I think they just got caught two pretty good counter attacks but yeah for me Milan's defence has to step up in this game otherwise I think this could go to Napoli's way Oh interesting I mean it's going to be absolutely fascinating and, and I'm really pleased to see that compared to about a month ago when both sides were kind of uh, I was about to say yeah riddled with Covid for want of a better mm. word uh, Napoli only have High Sange missing it with it now AC Milan, according to Transfermarkt, have everyone available, which is great news for them, considering the 
dire defensive straits they were in a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but AC Milan, you know, history is really against them as well. Um, they haven't beaten Napoli in all competitions since December 2014, 11 games ago, which is absolutely crazy. In that time, they've drawn five and lost six, although they have drawn their last three fixtures. So history would suggest that this is Napoli's to lose. My Cubs, I need a score prediction. Oh, I'm going to say 2-0 to Napoli. Oh, Henry, what do you reckon? Oh, I was going to go for that. Um, the easy one. Oh, you know, I, I got the Dortmund, I got the De Classica score right. I'll go, I'll go 3-1. I'll go 3-1. Do you? You really Napoli. are the Oracle. You've got these, I think you've got two big match preview score predictions right now. <laughs> I am going to go with a highly entertaining 2-2 draw. It's going to be an absolute thriller. Sunday, 7.45pm. Let's move on to our quick fire question. Okay, our quick fire question comes in from at Glorious Magnifico, and it's does Joachim Lowe need to be replaced as Germany boss? Henry, what are your thoughts on this after a 6-0 battering? Yeah, I feel pretty strongly about this. I have felt pretty strongly about this uh, since the since the World Cup, in fact. I think I think what he's achieved at Germany is amazing. There's longevity in that role there. I think he's been brilliant, but I do think he has to go. I think to pin the blame on other players and you know, get rid of Joran Berteng and even Thomas Müller, I think it's absolutely crazy that they've both been excluded from this Germany squad. They're both leaders. I was reading, you know, Bastian Schweinsteiger, Lothar Matthäus, a number, of, even Ozil's uh, obviously come out and said, a number of big stars have said it's just silly that the two of the biggest leader at Bayern Munich, the best team in, what, um, in club football right now, the fact that they're not included in the Germany squads out of this kind of principal reason is silly. And there's the blame can only go on other players only so long. I think Jürgen Löw, he needs to leave now with his head held high and give some of the opportunity. The only problem is who would succeed him. I think they're waiting for Jürgen Klopp. That's really what they want. And maybe Thomas Tuchel, I can only see as someone who could maybe be tempted away from PSG. That's the only tricky thing is who would step in. But yes, I do think it's time for Vacuum Blow. If you can't lose 6-0 to Spain, I'm sorry, I don't care. They're a good time, good team, but you can't lose 6-0 in the international stage. I think it's time for him to move on. Yeah, fair. <laughs> I mean, they're talking about Ralph Ragnick as well, which would be really interesting, having mm. you know, having his reputation for developing players as well. But McCubbs, whoever comes in, if, jo- if Joachim Lowe does leave, I mean, he's got a lot of talent to work with. Yeah, I think that's the thing, you know, that regardless of who he leaves out, like, you've always got... <laughs> A ton of talent there don't you like i mean germany do still have like probably in the top two or three um best you know best talent pools in in world football mm. um so you know like you, you you should be able to afford to to leave out someone like thomas muller and, and and be able to get you know similar output from other players um so yeah no i think yeah i, th- I think I, I think yeah similarly to Henry I don't really have anything more to say on it like should have definitely gone after the 2018 World Cup that was like a really disgraceful display for in all three games at that at that tournament from Germany um yeah I don't know why he didn't go then and can I, I just, certainly can I, don't know why he's not he, he's not gone now can I just add it's not this 6-0 result isn't like an isolated result they've only yeah. won about three games since the World Cup they've been mm. so poor in the Nations League and even the qualifiers they've, this, they've not been great and yeah like you said they've got such good pool of players surely they need the right coach at the moment to blend that next generation of players and I think all his stalwarts that made him so successful under the Klinsmann era and hit and now they're, they're, if he's moved all them on I think they need a fresh fresh face yeah. fresh ideas to move them on yeah I think that's what it is it's just it's just it's just kind of just a change of just a little bit of a change of scene I guess like because mm. you know international management isn't it isn't overly complex you know you need to be a good man manager you, you need to have you need to kind of know your best 11 and you know, and, and you have to have, you know, a fairly, I don't know, I guess you've got to be fairly tactically flexible. Um, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be one of the best coaches in the world. And I think, you know, we've never talked about Jakim Lowe as being one of the best coaches in the world, despite what he's achieved with Germany. Like they just, yeah, they just they just need someone who, first of all, is going to get on really well with the players. And yeah, and someone who, yeah, just, just brings a little bit of freshness to that because yeah, there's so much potential there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think his experimentations with three at the back really haven't worked as well. I mean, he, they, they went to that during, I think, halfway through the game against Spain and it just didn't work at all. They weren't intense at all, tense enough with their defending. They, they you know, stood off Spain so easy. Some of their goals were just, you know, well taken finishes, but too basic for a side of the quality of Germany. And to be honest, Joachim Lowe, I sort of lost uh, respect for him when he started sniffing his fingers in 2014. I thought, <laughs> such a weird guy. But yeah, that's my take on Joachim Lowe. I think I'm kind of with you guys. I think the, the ship oh. has sailed on him. 
But guys, that's all we've got time for on Continental Club for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Let us know what you guys thought of the biggest disappointments of the season so far. Who you think is going to win in Napoli versus AC Milan. And who should replace Joachim Lowe if he does leave the Germany post? McCubs, if they've enjoyed this, what should they go and watch next? Uh, they should go and watch, or they should wait tomorrow for tomorrow, first of all, to watch the Football Pyramids. Danny Pape versus Sonny in a Spurs special. Epic clash. Um, they should go and watch the latest Scout report. Um, I can't actually remember what that's on. Um, <laughs> but uh, but that, that came out yesterday, I believe. Um, and also, yeah, go and check out our um, EFD Explains, a new series. We've done one on Barcelona on why, they're, uh, why they could go bankrupt. And we've done one on Real Madrid. Uh, why they stopped signing Galacticos. Um, yeah, both have been pretty well received so far. So thanks to everyone who's watched that and give it, given it a like. But if you haven't checked them out already, um, go and watch them because they're good. Perfect. Any final words from you, Henry? Oh, I can't add. I mean, you've pretty much uh, hogged every single strategy. <laughs> so, so, no, it's, it's all, good, all good stuff. All good stuff at uh, Football Daily. Perfect. Thank you very much for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye.